Welcome to Once Upon a Time in Quarantine, a series of tasks completed by me, Aiden Kunst, and my senior project, 2020. Here goes nothing. Task 1, The Interview, my conversation with Evansville Courier and Press sports reporter, Kyle Soakland. For the first of my entrepreneurial learning tasks, I decided to interview Mr. Kyle Soakland of the Evansville Courier and Press, who I was originally scheduled to shadow. Kyle is an alumnus of Indiana University, where I will possibly attend in the fall and possibly never actually attend, because at this point, who knows? He kept busy while there as a four-year member of the celebrated Marching 100 band, and because of this, he told me he was unable to ever write for the Indiana Daily Student, IU student newspaper, something he regrets. After graduating, he found the sports writer job market tough, shocker, and ended up working for his father, also a sports writer, on a website that followed Indiana high school sports. After a few successful years working with his dad, Kyle made the jump from low-level sports reporter to covering high school sports at the Evansville Courier and Press. In case there were any doubts, yes, I did actually interview Kyle, and here is the proof. On that screen is a screenshot of part of my interview with Kyle, which I conducted through Gmail. I asked Kyle six questions, ranging from advice for someone starting at IU in the fall to his favorite sport to cover, football. What struck me most, though, was his answer when I asked him what the biggest piece of advice for someone starting in the industry was. He responded with this quote, something his father had once bestowed upon him, and the quote is particularly relevant to my career choice of sports journalism, as it is a brutal job market that has been hit even harder by the COVID-19 crisis. A willingness to work hard should serve me well as I embark into this journey of adulthood. Task 2. You've got mail. My thank you note to someone who has made a positive impact on my life. Yes, I did actually write a thank you note. Here it is, consolidated over 20 seconds. The second of my entrepreneurial learning tasks also dealt with writing, my career choice, but in a different way. I decided to write a thank you note to someone who has made a positive impact on my life, and that person is day school's director of marketing and one of my mentors, Mrs. Amanda Boltemeyer. This past year, she guided me through an internship in communications, one where I learned about the vast number of ways in which the field of communications can be applied in adult life. She always greeted me with a smile on her face, always allowed ample room for mistakes, and truly showed me the ropes of the industry. For that, I'm incredibly grateful. Through my internship with Mrs. Boltemeyer, adulthood became more real for me. It became something that wasn't so far away, and I got to look at a true professional working at her craft. It was a great experience, and I will always be thankful for the time that Ms. Boltemeyer gave me. Task three, when a stranger calls my phone call with the Office of Dickinson Chiropractic and Acupuncture. I decided to complete the task of a phone call with proper etiquette because I needed to make an appointment with the chiropractor and because I know that in my intended career of sports media, I will need to make many a phone call when dealing with high-profile athletes. I will certainly need good phone etiquette lest they hang up on me. Here are some photos of me on the phone with the lady from Dickinson as I scheduled an appointment for Thursday. In the next slide, I have an excerpt from the call where I politely tell this lady thank you and to have a nice day. Enjoy. Um, I'll take nine o'clock, please. Thank you. Sounds good, thank you. All right, you're welcome, have a good day. You too. Thank you. Task four, 
The Paper Chase, where I research three different international newspapers and examine how they're covering the COVID-19 pandemic. The first news site I read was the China Daily. I found an article that looked at the reopening of the tourism industry in the Hubei region of China, which is home to Wuhan, the site of the inception of the virus. This presented the pandemic as if it were in the rearview mirror and looked ahead to the future, offering an encouraging outlook on the tourism industry given that China is mostly past the first wave of the pandemic. The picture included is of several tourists riding their bikes across China's floating bridge, all of whom are still wearing masks. The China Daily took the approach that the pandemic is pretty much behind China, that tourism is up and running again, and that everyday life is hopefully going to come back to normal in the near future. It was an interesting look and a stark contrast to where we are now in the U.S. Next, I went across the pond to read the Sunday Times. Sorry, sorry. Uh, Sunday Times, one of Great Britain's numerous papers. Their article detailed Prime Minister Boris Johnson's battle with COVID-19 and how he was on the precipice of death. Johnson went into intensive care on April 6th and was reportedly given liters and liters of oxygen. The Times has the ability to look at the pandemic from an interesting angle, since their leader actually dealt with the symptoms and has a first-hand vantage point of what it actually does. I think that in many places, COVID-19 is just this invisible enemy that none of us really know what to do with. We simply know we don't want it. In Britain, with Johnson having had the virus, it provided for a unique perspective, and the Sunday Times captured it perfectly in the article I looked at. Finally, I thought it would be really interesting to examine an African news outlet, so I found a newspaper called The East African. The article I looked at discussed the use of drones in Rwanda to combat the lack of hospitals during the coronavirus pandemic. Their media presented an interesting example of something we talk about often here at Day, resilience. These people are being incredibly resilient in times of great difficulty, and have discovered a way to battle the virus in a way that is incredibly innovative. I think about drones being easy to find in America's retail stores and that in Rwanda, these are so hard to come by. The article shows just how much harder it is to deal with something of that magnitude in a third world country, but also how these third world countries are trailblazing new ideas that everyone can use during this tough time for the entire world. Task five, pay it forward. My look at three charities or nonprofits that I can hopefully one day contribute to. Nothing But Nets is the first charity that I would one day hope to contribute to, and it asks for donations in order to send bed nets to help fight malaria. This is a charity that I've always been interested in since I was a kid, in part because at the time, the many basketball partnerships uh, drew me to the charity. Various prominent basketball players have done shooting competitions to raise money, and I have always enjoyed the obvious connection to my favorite sport, basketball. I don't just like the charity because of the name, though, I promise. I've researched malaria and the effect it has on children in impoverished areas, and it is something that needs to be addressed. Malaria killed over 400,000 people last year alone and continues to make its mark, particularly in places of severe poverty. Diseases like malaria while not COVID-19, and not possibly not on that scale, have such a large impact on impoverished places and need to be addressed. And that's why I feel that Nothing But Nets is an extremely important charity that one day I'd like to give to. I wanted to include a local organization because when I'm older, I would like to contribute to local charities. And this one makes a lot of sense to me because my mom works there but also because I've done a lot of research on the vast importance of mental health in 2020. It is quite possibly the most serious issue amongst young people like myself right now, and the contributions of social workers have never been more valuable. People like Miss Laura Eric at day school, one of my favorite faculty members, have a major impact on teenagers who are struggling. Because of how important a mental health issue is right now, I think Youth First would be an ideal nonprofit to contribute to when I'm older. Going forward, Mental health is so important to fight because it can be so hard to diagnose. And when we do finally see it in people, it is often too late uh, that people are struggling with mental health. But Youth First does a great job of addressing this before it's too late through the use of social workers 
And for that reason, I think I, I would love to, to give to it when I'm older. A third charity that I would one day like to donate to is the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research. Uh, of course, founded by Michael J. Fox, the actor who himself has Parkinson's. And this one means a lot to me because my grandmother has Parkinson's disease. So I've seen firsthand what it can do to people. Uh, and, and I found the Michael J. Fox Foundation. I knew I wanted to have uh, a Parkinson's foundation on here or a research-based foundation on here. And the Michael J. Fox one has done great work in terms of the money it's raised to fund research programs. Um, I think in the future when I have the money to contribute consistently to the foundation, it would mean a lot to me knowing that I would was helping people who struggle in similar ways to my grandma. So that's why I included the uh, Michael J. Fox Foundation on here for, for Parkinson's research. Task six, some like it hot. I wanted to try something new and fail at it until I succeeded. So naturally I chose something I have pretty much zero experience in, cooking. Now, some of you might be looking at these pictures and thinking, pancakes, that's barely cooking. That's one of the easier forms of cooking. Now, let me assure you, it's not that easy, at least for me. Simple as that may seem to some, I had to grease the pan, measure the correct amount of mix, pour the mix into the pan. Something that for me was pretty tough to do easily, and as you can see, I'm not exactly a pro yet. My first attempt at a large blueberry pancake didn't go very well, uh, but I learned from it and was ultimately able to make some pretty good silver dollar pancakes. So sit back and enjoy the show. You keep trying to commute it. I don't know, man. I'm going in. Yes! Let's go. That's a darn good looking silver dollar there. Yeah. I'm confident now. It's a dangerous man. Let's go! You saw that. You saw that. Task 7, The Fast and the Furious, in which I learn how to change a tire. This was the most physically demanding task of the 10 for the simple reason that I was three quarters of the way done changing a tire on my family's red van before realizing that the tire jack I had wasn't going to be able to work for that kind of car. After expending a ton of energy doing that, I was dead tired, and yet, like the adult I'm learning to be, sucked it up and was able to fully change the tire on the gray car. This one definitely taught me the importance of patience and the lesson that in adulthood, you have to be willing and able to handle curveballs and adapt. I did so and now I can change a tire. Task 8, Too Fast, Too Furious, my second task involving cars and my education in the subjects of oil, washer fluid, and tire pressure. I started with the tire pressure, first checking the PSI level that we were supposed to have, which can be found on the inside of the driver's side door, and then testing the actual pressure of the tire using a digital device that gave me the PSI. 
For our car, the ideal PSI is 35, but when I checked the pressure, we were at 32.5, and the tire looked like it could use some air. This was completed on May 6th, some seven weeks into quarantine, so please, don't judge the haircut. I know it's bad. Next, I pulled a little lever under the steering wheel, and the hood was popped open. And then, I learned how to check the car's oil. I pulled out the dipstick and made sure that the oil was comfortably above the minimum marker. It was, if the thumbs up isn't an indicator. After wiping it off on a paper towel, I inserted the dipstick back into the tube and moved on. That was easy. About two feet to the left of the oil tube is a translucent container called the Washer Fluid Reservoir. Who knew something like this could have such a fancy name? I removed the cap and peered in, checking the fullness of this so-called reservoir. Unfortunately, we were running low on fluid, but didn't have any extra fluid on us, hence the thumbs down. This was a relatively painless exercise, and yet another piece of adulthood that is actually pretty simple. Maybe this isn't so hard. Task 9, Iron Man. I'll give you three seconds to guess which one this is. Three, two, one. Yeah, guys, it's ironing a shirt. Unlike the majority of my tasks, this one has history. When he was a kid, my grandfather's mom forced him to do all of the family's ironing, and so from a young age, he was a master with an iron. When he fought in the army during the Vietnam War, his ironing skills were once again called upon, as the soldiers had to do their own ironing there, too. When he married my grandma, he, he taught her how to iron, and then my mom when she came of age. And now, perhaps I am well past whatever age should be, but I'm finally learning. As an adult in my career of media, there will be times when I need to look sharp. So ironing a shirt is an essential skill. After ironing the shirt, I put it on for my very first picture in a shirt ironed by me. Truly a historic moment, one of those pictures that will undoubtedly go down in the history books. After nine tough adulting tasks, just one stands between me and the finish line. And it is the most daunting of them all. Ladies and gentlemen, Bulletproof Monk my 30-minute yoga session. This is Aiden Kunst, Task 10, Bulletproof Monk, Yoga for Writers. My toughest challenge yet. Let's go. The task at hand was a 30-minute video called Yoga for Writers with Adrienne. As my mother and I both fit that bill, we decided to participate in the session. By the way, buy my mom's book of poems, The Way Through, hitting stores this June. Anyway, as much as I am sure everyone watching this video is enjoying the pictures of me in a variety of poses, from child's pose, top right, to downward dog, bottom right, these 30 minutes proved to be incredibly valuable. A great deal of stress was relieved from my body, but more importantly, from my mind. I don't have much experience with this kind of thing, but I found it extremely calming and a great way to escape for 30 minutes. I will definitely be doing this again, just probably not on camera for everyone to see. And now we have come to the end. While not what I was initially expecting, I had a lot of fun performing these tasks and learning more about what it means to be an adult. As I enter college and the real world beyond that, I will look back fondly on this as just another part of the madness that ensued once upon a time in quarantine.